so I'll go ahead and start. Um, so you had some questions about like workflow yesterday, and uh, I don't actually have the high poly in the scene, but I was able to find a JPEG of it from website. So I actually prefer using uh, sub these surfaces for making likenesses because it requires a lot of tweaking back and forth. And I feel like I have a lot more control over sub D surfaces. So I have one um, much lower poly head uh, that's, uh, I've got four different versions in different uh, head sizes. I think actually I can find that. Uh, and I you normally use those to start from when I'm making a sub D head. So, and then every time I uh, am done using soft select to morph it into a new head type before I start adding rings, I'll save that out as another type. So this way I can have like a good start to come from for various head types. Um, and then I made some close-ups of the uh, eyes and ears. So when I had it looking the way that I wanted to in I've been using X normal to do my normal bakes. I like it because of uh, it has like a checklist for what things should be visible when you bake. So I'll oftentimes do like I I had um, the uh, this um, red muscle in the corner of the eye is called the lacrimal caruncle, and it has in the low poly its own object. There's just a very small, low poly box in the corner of the eye. And it's important to have that separate because when the eyelid closes, that doesn't get squashed. It's just should, that object just stays there right with the head and the eyelid should be right to something else. So if you build that into the eyelid, it'll look really weird when it squishes. But uh, for example, I wanted uh, the, the, on the uh, diffuse fake for the AO from the head, the ambient occlusion from the head, to show up on the diffuse of this lacrimal caruncle, but with the normal bake, I want it to be smooth, so that way in X normal you can just bake it once with the normal, and you can uncheck everything but this object, and then you can bake it again with everything checked for getting your diffuse. So by doing that, you can, um, and especially if there were mechanical bits on the head or the hair, like for example, if you sculpted a high poly hair, and you wanted parts of the, the where the hair was coming up like this, if it was smoothed back, you might want to have this part baked into the normal map, but then maybe there's more to the hair that comes up that gets, you know, messes up somewhere else when it falls down. So you can bake two versions of the normal map and you can steal the part that has the smooth part from one and use the part where the hair wasn't visible to, to bake out irregularities in the other. So I use X normal to bake the normal map. Um, the low poly, I basically just, one of the other reasons I like starting from sub D surfaces is that you have really close object to what you can use for your low poly. It's not like with the ZBrush when you just basically have to start from scratch or use a topology program to um, res down. And I wanted this one to be fairly um, high poly even for the end game. So one of the, one of the big changes is with sub D, you need to have your control edges like um, you can see some of these get really tight on the edge of the lips and that's in order to make creases you can see right here, there's a sharp crease. And just to show you, I have a picture of. Uh, soft box in the front and then a um, 
second light at half intensity that's bounced off the wall behind. So this way, everything is very soft. There's almost no shadows, but there's still a directionality. You can see that the side of the face is darker than the front of the face, and it defines the planes. So when I was able to, um, came to the diffuse map, it was super easy to uh, project, to use this as the, for the diffuse texture. And um, by, the other thing is that I didn't have him move. If you're ever taking reference photos, even if it's really shitty lighting, you move around the person, don't have them move. Because if I stand like this, and let's say the, the, some of the screen is on my face, and you take the picture here, and then you go over there and take the picture, the light is in the exact same spot, so you have uh, references to be able to see where it's the same in both. Whereas if I then were to move like this, and you're just staying there and taking the pictures, the lighting information changes. The only reference points you have are hard edges, like under the nose, the freckle that obviously hasn't moved, the eyes, that kind of thing. So always try and um, view move around the person. So if you don't have lighting, which you know, a lot of people aren't big on photography as a hobby like I am, so you might not have a suitcase full of lighting equipment, is wait for an overcast day. And what's really good is if you can, um, if, if it's really dark everywhere, and then the, you can kind of see the sun through the clouds uh, to one side, then you'll get very soft lighting with no shadows that has a directionality to it. You have them face where the brightest part of the sky is, and then you walk around. And the other inter uh, important thing is to use the longest lens that you have, because you'll get distortion if you have something like an iPhone or a, a camera with a um, 35 or a 50 millimeter lens. You have to get close, and you'll end up seeing more of the front of their face, and the sides will wrap around. And that will especially mess up then when you go to the side to take another picture. So it's better to use 85 millimeters or above. And then you it's almost like an orthogonal image where you see as much as you can. Um, the problem with that is the longer the lens is, the larger the space you need to be able to walk around the person to take all the pictures. So I, when I set everything up, I made sure that the chair he was going to sit in it was in the middle of the room. And even then, there were times when I was like, on my couch, you know, trying to be as far away as possible to still um, get the picture from the same distance all the way around. And then even better is if you can take a piece of yarn or string and kind of just make a loop around their waist and, and pull it out to your distance and then that way you can just walk around with it and you know you're always the same distance from the person instead of going um, closer or further. So this was my reference images. Uh, I baked the um, high poly and X normal down to the low poly, which I just made mostly by uh, collapsing edges. And you can see uh, here in the high poly, I would have two edges here. Uh, do, does everyone know the difference between a Bezier curve and a cardinal curve? It's from your math class. All right, so a Bezier curve is a weighted curve, and a cardinal curve is an absolute curve. So in a Bezier curve, it's like an illustrator. You, um, or I'm sorry, a cardinal curve is like an illustrator. The curve has to pass through every point that's controlling it. Whereas a Bezier curve, the points are weighted. So you can pull the point way, way away, but the curve doesn't actually follow it 100%. It just kind of, you know, trends towards it. And that's how sub-D surface works. It's a three-dimensional um, Bezier curve. So when you make an edge and you apply a turbo smooth, if it sticks way out like this, it, it, it smooths away when you put on Turbo Smooth or Mesh Smooth or whatever the smoothing algorithm is in the program. Whereas with these, we have one, two, three, four, all the way in almost a straight line. They almost don't do anything uh, when you apply sub -D. So with um, uh, the corner of the nose and anything that has a hard change in surface, you end up having to have multiple points, uh, multiple edges close together in order to constrain that um, sub the surface so that it stays creased when you when it smooths. A low poly, that's not important. So you can just have the um, you know the edges have a radical change in direction. You can see it's something almost like a 90 degree angle change here. And in a traditional game without a normal map, that wouldn't be very good. You would get poor smoothing from the such a direct angle change. So you might either want to have two edges close together, just like in sub D if you've got the poly count, or you could have um, something, you know, divided in half here.
but my goal with the low poly was to keep almost all of the polygons almost the same size, so each one of the edges should be the same, and then uh, giving room for both uh, uh, animation purposes, so like around the eyes and around the mouth a little bit more for making expressions with more targets, and then more around the nose because there's more detail changes and it would look chunkier if the edges were all the same here, so that's why it's <coughs> tighter in this direction. The other thing that's good to do, and, and the reason why there is an edge right here, is that this is one of the, the areas where it kind of breaks the surface. And I'll um, oftentimes use uh, this lighting mode. It won't work very well um, because this has a texture on it. But this way, you can, you can just put a black uh, material on something, and you can look at it like this, and you can see any time uh, edges become too sharp, so maybe like the next part I would care about would be here on the chin or here on the back where you can see it, but for the most part I've already done this process and tried to keep everything uh, smooth the way. Um, so I, I was noticing that I was getting some angles here and it wasn't smoothing so well, so that's why it has um, more edges here. So I got my low poly, I bake it. Um, this one I wanted to have quite realistic and use a large texture map so nothing is mirrored in the UVs. And once I've done the bake the normal map from this high poly, you'll notice that it's extremely smooth. There's almost no texture to it. There's no real wrinkles around the eyes or anything. It's just all the major forms. So I need to be able to extract these details or add them somehow. This is a very young guy and he doesn't have too many uh, wrinkles, but there are some that if I you can see some details, especially as the angle of the light changes. There's some. There's not too many wrinkles, but there's some texture and uh, pores and details on it. So the next thing that I did is I go into body paint and create the diffuse map. So this is just these. Um, photos that I took for the reference, and I took um, front, the two sides, the back, and then I also did the three quarters from each side. I stood on a chair and did the top of the head, and then I also went from uh, below the two angles in order to be able to get under the eyes, under the chin, and then um, some, some close-ups of various angles around the nose and the eyes. So the first thing I do is I take the front um, picture, and in body paint, also in 3D coat and several others, it'll have a projection mode. So you can go into an actual um, orth orthogonal view. Hit, uh, well, I don't have my shortcut set up on here, but go into projection mode and it will let you paste a picture from your clipboard or from Photoshop directly on and move it around. So if I were to, I can show you real quick. Let's go into here. Okay, copy the image, come to here, make a new layer, and paste. So now here is my picture, and assuming this had some kind of relevance to the model underneath, when, I, when it's lined up the way that I want, I say yes, do I want to transform the layer? And now it's projected as well as it could be. Obviously this has no relevance to the, to the model, but it's imagine what would happen with the correct texture. So this one's already been kind of flattened down to have everything already overlapped. But, but with all of those pictures, the only areas that I had to clean up were basically between the lips here, um, a small, some small areas here around the nose, um, a little bit of the area around the eyes, because I UV map as if their eyes are closed. And that way you can get some uh, detail <coughs> for when their, eye, their eyelids do close. And it's this exact, that's exactly how it works, our real eyes. If you were to put, uh, you know, paint a picture on my eyelid, and then I open it, it gets all squished up. So it doesn't matter that the model might be modeled with the eyes open. If the UVs are stretched as if it's closed, as soon as the eyes are actually open, that gets squished the way that the real eyes work. So it's, it works really well. So there's, um, you can see the UV. There's a very small opening here, and most of the space is given towards, I'm going to make sure it shows up, no, 
if I can barely see it here from the entire disk, I guess. Oh, so this shows better. So this is the edge. Um, if I go back to here. So one of the things that's really important is to make sure you get this edge along the eyelids. We have, it's, it's, a, it's a ledge between, you've got the very front of the eyelid, you've got the eyeball itself sitting inside of the head, and then you have this ledge that's very clearly visible uh, on people in photographs unless their eyes are actually shut or unless the camera angle is way down. So even when texturing diffuse only on a flat plane of a low poly, I make sure I paint in the texture of the top of that ledge. So this is modeled in in order, and the edges line up from top to bottom of the eye so that when it closes they can meet even though it's not super high poly. And I give m more space to that than I do these um, triangles that go away in. So for example, if I show the diffuse map on the eye, the eyes, the eye shell, so it can even go x-ray. But you can see the, this edge is way, 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 way inside of the head. And what that does is do that. So see, see the triangle going all the way back? What that does is you don't even actually have to have that um, ledge if it's a lower poly model and it's still, by pulling it way back, you get a 90 degree change between the front of the eyelid and it going all the way back. If you had it moved closer and it were almost where the eye is, now you can see the angle of those planes. So the further back you pull it, the more um, perpendicular they get. So I steal almost all of the actual surface area from these because it's not important. You never see if the eyeballs themselves are blocking it. But this way I can give more space to the um, edge of the eyelid part. So I had to paint in a little bit of that. And then the other part that's very hard to get uh, with photographic projection is the back of the ear because it's you know like this and it's really not that important. So I do the, the front projection the side projections, I do the three quarters, I make all of them as a new, um, how do I exit this without a shortcut? Um, so one of, in, in body paint, I'm not exactly sure how it works in um, ZBrush or 3D Coat, when you make a projection and then and then leave the projection mode, it puts that into the current layer that you're on. So every time I make a new uh, project, a new photo, I make a new layer. So you've got front, side, three quarters, back. Each of them has their own layer, and there'll be areas that are messy. They got stretched. So then I'll just put a mask on that layer, erase out all the stretched parts, and by the end, you projected all the textures. You have basically everything provided. If you only have, say, like a front and a side, like for example, a lot of um, uh, you can go on Getty Images, and because there are a lot of stock photographers who make their money from microstock, they'll, when they get a model in the studio, they'll take photos of them a lot of times from at least the front and the side. So you can search something like uh, you need a 15-year-old boy for a, a specific a character in a game, or you need like a 80-year-old grandmother. You can search for that, and oftentimes you'll find a whole photo session where you'll be able to find at least a front and a side view of the same model in roughly the same lighting. Um, there are also dedicated sites like, um, uh, what is it called, 3D.SK. Uh, and the only problem with that is there's a black guy with cornrows in that site that's been in every single video game that's shipped. I mean, it's like one of the first guys that comes up on 3D.SK, and so everyone has used it in every game. And you run into the problem of potentially copying the features of the character that are already in other games, which is annoying. And one uh, easy way to do to around that that I've used at a past company is to use one person for your model reference and then use a whole other person to do your texture reference. So then the, there's enough of a mix up that it doesn't look like either person. So even if you just have the front and the side of let's say a grandmother from a photo shoot, project your front image, mask out all the garbage so that you're only left with the good pixels, project your side image, mask out all the garbage so you're only left with your good pixels, and you'll see exactly the areas that you don't have texture work from. 
but now you've got all these awesome areas to sample color from. Most of the work is done in terms of the two most important parts, side and front, and you can just kind of make up the in-between with all those clues and colors that you've already been given. And I've had to do that for a few advertising um, heads where they said, here's the exact look we want, we've licensed these two photos in order to be able to use, make it look like these characters. So I projected the front, projected the side, and it was really easy to come up with the areas that were missing. So now I've got the diffuse on here, and for some games this would be enough. Maybe it's not a normal map game and a diffuse texture is enough detail. But um, because this was supposed to be for a normal map asset, I needed to make the rest of it. So this is my diffuse folder, and it has all of my information for the diffuse. The next thing that I did was to make my normal map, because I think that's the next most important for uh, making a character. Now, I already had the low poly, or the bit, sorry, the bake from, I know it. So this is just the bake from X normal. So I put in the low poly, put in the high poly, baked it, uh, cleaned up any problems, um, and you can see that the, uh, down here, these two areas are where those pink corner triangle muscles uh, are, are UV mapped. And that's all that's in here in this texture. I have the eyes on a separate texture. Um, so this is far too smooth. If this was applied as the texture, all it does is fix a few smoothing problems around the nose and ears, adds a little bit of detail to the ears and a little bit around the eyes and mouth. There's, it doesn't really provide all that much. But by taking the diffuse, um, the diffuse um, texture that I created, I basically did some editing to this to try and make, um, I did it two times. So once I tried to use to get from the pores, and that one you can basically run a high pass filter in Photoshop and you can boil it down to just the noise. You can make a pore pass in normal map from that. Then the, then the next was I wanted to get the hairs. Well the hairs are dark and most, and then the skin is light and that's a problem for trying to use height information. So I did another, copied everything, the diffuse image, and in Photoshop I inverted it, I used some contrast and uh, various filters to basically get all of the hair is white and all of the skin is black. I ran that through, um, I think I was using Crazy Bone to get a normal map out of that. And then you can basically combine all these images until you get where um, poor uh, uh, freckles, you can see in here, this is a freckle here, and you would expect freckles to come up, so because I had made a layer with white for, um, you know, for representing all the uh, freckles, I've got in the normal map where all of that comes up, and details around the eyes, everything basically follows the general size and detail that it would on the character, and that was all extracted from the diffuse map. The other benefit from doing it this way is that you have a specific resolution. It might be your engine accepts a 512 by 512 texture. Well, if you make your 512 by 512 diffuse, it's now 512 by 512, very obvious. But when you run a filter on it, or um, you, when you extract the normal map details from that, you know that the texture is always gonna hold those details because they're made at that resolution. But whereas if you go into ZBrush, you could sculpt down to this crazy detailed level that a 512 by 512 could never hold, or that, you know, like maybe you're forced to have a 256 by 256, or who knows what the size is supposed to be. But when you draw it off of a, a 2D, two-dimensional texture, you already know it's gonna hold that detail because it's already present there. And it also, you know, it's gonna line up one-to-one -one when it comes from, you know, when you run the crazy bump with that freckle right there, you know it's gonna come up on that level uh, in the same place. So I have the, the normals created from it, the diffuse, the specular. Um, I made sure whenever I, whenever I make one of these layers for pores or the hair or the uh, wrinkles in the face, I make sure I save those because I know I can use them multiple times. I can use them in the specular. I can use them to make the normal. I can use them, for example, if now the hairs on the head shouldn't be brown, they should be reddish. I've got a black and white map that shows me exactly where the hairs are that I could use for a, a, a hue saturation layer. So this is mostly these um, black and white converted layers from the diffuse 
in order to make my specular map, and then I have some, um, some color variation to get, uh, um, so the skin isn't all just shiny with white, which is very boring. And then there are certain areas of the face that are shinier. The nose is very smooth. It doesn't have much texture. It's oftentimes oil, oily from being touched. The same thing about the um, eyelids around the eyes, sometimes also the forehead, and the ears are very smooth without uh, much texture. So that's why all of those are made slightly brighter. And then the hair, <clears throat> because I have hair objects, that's what I want to shine. If I had specular on the actual sphere of the head here, um, let me go back into body paint. So if this part of the head here shines, but then there's 3D hair objects on top of it, you're gonna kind of get the giveaway. You're gonna see that there's this solid object underneath. And there are times when that works. If someone, for example, is going bald and you can see part of their scalp and then you see the shock of hair in the front, obviously you're gonna see that the head itself shine and then this hair blocks. Or if someone's hair is thinning, you might see both. But for anyone who has a normal set of hair, you almost never get to see evidence of the scalp. You're only ever seeing the hair objects themselves. But when we make video game hair, it oftentimes has to be much lower poly, um, and there's lots of times when the camera angle or the way the lighting hits or if the shadows aren't perfect, that the light can hit off of the, um, the scalp object itself. So by making that pitch black in the specular and reflection map and anything else, um, you can make sure that the light never gets hit off of that, and you'll only ever see it in the diffuse, which is, which is much more okay. So that's why the specular is uh, jet black up here. Then also, you can see, sorry for the jumping around in the screen. So this is the lacrimal caruncle. This is the specular map. So this, this part of the model oftentimes shines. Or, and this part in a real person, it's wet. It's got the tears from the eye on it. So it's very specular. So I played that up a lot so that it has uh, almost pure white on it so that it would shine way before anything else shines on the model. And then you'll also see that there's a whole bunch of contrast within the specular map. And that's because that will simulate the uh, smoothness, or sorry, the non-smoothness of the skin. So in real life, we don't actually have a separation between specular and reflection. It's just reflection. There's no such thing as shine that's not a reflection of the light. It's because one, real life has perfect lighting model. There's no shortcuts taken because it's real life. Um, and then also because of how finely textured an object can be. So something like this, I can see the bounce of the light off of the screen, but I can't make out any of the picture on it. And that's because it's very, very smooth, but it has a texture to it. It's got, you know, if we could look at it under a microscope, it would have a lot of bumps. And then it's um, not very, the material itself is not very re reflective. So that shine that's unrecognizable is actually just very dim, very blurry reflection of the screen. In video games, we kind of have to separate those out. So we would actually just have this be a specular map, and we'd make it very dim. And then the only time we would put a reflection map on something is if this were very highly reflective metal, or if I'm wearing glasses, or here on this bottle. Because then we want to see something recognizable from within the object to tell us that it's super smooth glass, or a mirror, or some kind of thing like that. So. One of the ways that you can fake that, that you can spread the, the highlight out more while having it still be recognizable, is to have a very noisy specular map. Because if this was all the same shade of gray and you got your specular reflecting off of it, you would get this nice little hot specular spot with the, where it would fade out smoothly. But with these black spots all over it, those are areas where you're not gonna see uh, the specular shine because this is controlling it. It's saying white should shine, black should not shine. The colored parts, if you get a colored RGB map, it's saying this should shine blue and this should shine purple, that should shine pink. Um, and, and this is just kind of something people have learned to help make skin look better. So almost all reflection maps or specular maps are bluish for skin. Um, it helps um, get the uh, specular highlights to be a bit warmer, or sorry, a bit cooler. Even when the lights themselves are not cool, it sort of simulates this you know, blue sky in a lot of uh, photographs, even when the person is inside. 
So the black spots will then kind of um, break up the smoothness of this specular when it hits on. So oftentimes, if you ever get a chance to look at specular maps from games, they're 10 times more contrasty and noisy than the diffuse maps or the normal maps. And that's because you, you're, you're basically having to cut out completely or show completely this specular, because very few things have a strong specular. Um, a specular map like this on this Dr. Pepper bottle would look horrible because it's all supposed to be shiny, but most things are not very um, reflective. They, they, you know, the carpet might every once in a while have a piece of metal in it that is very shiny, or you know, something could have a scratch on it that makes it shinier. Um, so that's why there's so much more noise in the specular map. Now this particular model uh, for the shader, I also have a gloss map. And a gloss map is another way that we're faking this separation between specularity and um, reflection. So in the real world, gloss is controlled by this fine texture on a surface. The more textured it is, the um, wider the specular highlight is spread out. And the smoother the surface, the tighter it is. And that's why something shiny has a very clearly recognizable, you can see the shape of the light bulb perfectly, whereas something not so reflective, it's just kind of a blurry shape. But if you put something really bright, like for example, the best way to take it is if you've got a neon tube. So you take something that just looks roughly um, shiny but not reflective, and like this kind of thing, I can't recognize this character in the bounce off of this. But if I took a bright blue neon tube and I put it up, you could actually see the shape of the tube being reflected, and that helps you get the idea that this is reflection. So a gloss map will say, the specular map says how bright and what color something should shine. A gloss map says how wide or how tight should the specularity be. So like I was saying before, the nose, the under the eyes, the lips, the ears should probably be white here also, but I must have just forgotten. And then hair is also very shiny, so it needs a tighter uh, specularity, and that's why it's brighter. And then uh, the skin has a much broader one, and that's why it's black. So that's the gloss map controls that. And then I also have a reflection map uh, that it does a little bit for Fresnel and makes a kind of an implication of peach fuzz on the skin. But again, I didn't want anything to show on the scalp that would give away the low poly scalp, so it's black on there. Um, a good shader to try all of these things is the uh, Zoliol shader. It's, he's, it was made by two Dutch guys. One works at uh, splash damage, and one works at um, crisis or some, some place like this. They both have really interesting jobs, and they made this shader called Zoliol Shader, and it, I believe at some point it will be available again from zoliol.com, but I think it's down right now. Um, this is a really nice skin shader that you can use within Max. It can support three lights, it has some shadow types, and here you can see that I put in the spec, the gloss, the normal, the diffuse, and all the way down here to reflect. So if I take off the Diffuse map, and let me get rid of all but one light to make it more obvious. Right. So here you can see that no, what the normal map is doing. Watch if I turn it off and turn it on. So the big things that it's doing is helping to smooth the low poly and, and add more details around the lips, the eyes, and the nose, but then it's also adding some tiny details under the chin and the freckles on the side of the face. So the gloss map, you can probably barely see the change, but without it, everything has the same level of shine. And with it, there's a change between the areas around here, the nose and the mouth. The specular, again, is what actually provides shine. So without it, I think, let me turn it up some. Maybe this will. So if you can see how tight the specular is here on the nose and on the lip. The, the highlight has a very strong edge, and then it's much more blurry and diffuse here, and that's what the gloss map controls. The spec map, however, so here we can just see there. Now everything is shining in the equal amount with this red color. Let me make it white. Oh. 
So now everything is shining the same light. If I turn it on, we get, we get closer to the correct setting. And then we can turn the diffuse back on so we can see the setting as well. Another thing is it, it has is what's called um, a gradient-based shading. So this, um, how, has anyone done any shader work, like work with the actual shaders themselves? Okay. So with the, with normally with a, a shader, let's just imagine a sphere, you have, uh, it works off of something called the dot product. And the dot product basically says, um, and let's pretend the projector is the only light source in the room. So it, does, it says, is the surface facing directly towards the light source, or is it facing, you know, 90 degrees away, or is it facing all the way behind. And you can do all kinds of things to play around with that to get different effects in the shader. But what, um, and, but a normal plain blend or bomb or whatever the type of shader you have, it says if I'm facing the light, I'm lit. If I'm halfway away from the light, I should get 50% of the light. And if I'm facing all the way away, I'm dark, I'm in the shadows. And this is the kind of information that Doom 3, um, Unreal Engine 3, and a lot of engines just have this plain Jane implementation of what the light should do. But with real objects that aren't inorganic, I mean, this is how concrete behaves. Uh, this is how um, uh, a bowling ball behaves in lighting, most bowling balls. But if something is made out of something else, for example, a ball of jello doesn't work like that. It's not bright facing the light and black in the back because it's transparent. The light can go through it, so it's darker on the back and you see the specular on the front, but it stays very bright and glowy all the way throughout. And the same thing with skin, with an eyeball, with a glass of milk, with anything that has transparency, you get a color change. The um, light doesn't just go from bright to dark. And so if your materials don't do that, if they all go from white to gray to black, then it's gonna all look dead, like it's not an alive object because there's no light bouncing around. In, um, Film, we can simulate subsurface scattering or light bouncing into the object. We can use maps to say how thick the skin is or all of these kind of things that are still too expensive for games. There are a few hacks that simulate subsurface scattering, but very few ship games have had it in it to where it runs in real time in the game and not just in cutscenes, but it'll, it'll come. So one of the other things that you can do is you can tell the light how it should light from facing to 50% to the back with using a gradient map based lighting. And this has this option within Zolio shader. So this ramp is basically saying things that face the light should pull from this chunk of the texture. Things that are at the 50% mark should pull from this chunk of the texture. And things that are facing away should pull from this chunk of the texture for the lighting. So if I wanted to, I could put a neon green here in the far left side and rather than things being black uh, when they're facing away from the light, they would turn neon green. And so it's a way to have some control over the thing. So for example, if you want to make a, a ball of jello, you would, and it was strawberry jello, you would probably make it be white at the front, still almost white in the middle, but a little bit darker, and then still almost, you know, slightly darker, but then have some kind of saturation within this gradient so that the things in the back really look like they have a strong saturation. So with this turned on again, you can see the effect that it has on the skin. And, it, and what it is, is I just used a black to white gradient in Photoshop, and I just went from black to white, so now I'm starting with a normal shader. And then on the layer above, I went into um, a whole bunch of pictures of, because he's uh, white, a whole bunch of pictures of uh, various white people that had really strong colors to the uh, change in their skin and used a color picker in Photoshop set to um, uh, nine by nine average, which when you, most people use the color picker in Photoshop as the modifier, like you hold down alt and you can color pick. But the color picker is an actual tool. You can change to the eyedropper and now it's always the color picker. And it has tool options at the top. Is this a one by one, only sampling the exact pixel that I click on, or is it three by three? And if you change it to three by three, when you click, it samples the three by three grid around it, and you can change it to nine by nine and 15 by 15. So if you're sampling from a photograph, and you really wanna know the color of this area of a photograph, 
Well, there's a whole bunch of variation from pixel to pixel because of the texture of the skin. So if you go one by one, you're not really going to get the exact color. So it's better to change to a three by three or a nine by nine and get that average color of this area, of the area facing the light and the area facing all the way away. So I went in and, and made a gradient based on the, you know, the, the peachy color of facing the light, the pinky color of facing away from the light, and a few places in between. And I made a gradient map from that. And I drew that on the next layer in Photoshop. So now I have white to black, and I have this color range. And I put it into hue mode, and then just kind of backed it off until I had, uh, I, I played around with it with um, this diffuse map turned off. So this is with the gradient map, and this is without. So this one kind of looks a bit dead. There's no kind of life to the skin color. And with it on, you get, even though it, it looks like it's mostly just brightening, but there are some um, saturation changes that uh, help for at least visually to make it look more like it's skin and not just a statue that's been spray painted pink. Um, so this gradient map lends a lot of control within the Zolio shader as well. And then the other option that you can use if you don't want to use the ramp shader at all is what's called a half Lambert. And a half Lambert basically just doesn't let it go from white to gray to black. It kind of squeezes everything or throws the dot product further around so that it only goes from like white to two thirds gray and half gray. So it doesn't do any color work, but it keeps things from going so black. Uh, and then this has a control so that you can say exactly where it should go. And then the other really cool thing that the Zolio shader has is what's called a shaded hue. And what that does is it takes a, um, um, it does some math based on the actual diffuse texture so that your shadows get a little bit of color, more color from the diffuse. And you can play around with what um, amount that is. So if you don't have access to an engine and you're ma just making a preview of something in Max, this shader is awesome for um, getting all of your Um, and this is a good way to test within um, within Max and getting uh, various settings like this. So once I've made all, of, as I'm making these textures, I basically I have uh, Body Paint open, I have Max open with the Zolio shader with all of these things assigned, and then I'll oftentimes also have Photoshop open as well and Crazy Bump as well. And I'll start with getting once I've gotten the diffuse correct and I'm pulling everything off of it. I hide the diffuse and I'm really only looking at the, um, the normal map in here. So I get the normal map that how I'm happy uh, and then I turn the diffuse map back on and I start working on the specular and gloss. And I always try and work on it with the final uh, engine presentation visible. So you can't really, you know, I, this was for my portfolio so I know I was going to make a screenshot with this shader within Max. But if this were for an actual game using Unreal Engine 3 or Unity or whatever, then I would be constantly having my real-time display in Unity or in Unreal so that I can see the result. Because probably all of these textures would have to be adjusted if this were going into a game engine. So now I've wasted all this time and I have to figure out something else to, to get it work in another engine. Um, did you have any specific questions about the workflow that I didn't go over? No, it's pretty good. Did anyone else have any specific questions about uh, that workflow? How to do the eyes? Um, the eyes, I actually have a tutorial. So what it is is that, and this is basically how we do eyes in film. And there's a lot of ways to kind of fake this process. You can do it with shaders, with one object. You can do it. So the the problem is that an eye itself uh, has a lens. There's a there's a distance between the part we can actually see. The so if this is this eye sphere itself got the pupil, the colored pupil and iris are flat. And then you have a lens of clear material over top of it. And that's why when you close your eyes, if you have someone close their eyes for you and rotate their eyes back and forth, you can see this 
lens moving around behind the eyelid. It pokes out. So when you're looking to the side and a person looks at you, that lens refracts the eye and you can see it. It's a very cool effect because it's, it's essentially a piece of reflective glass. You know, it's not glass, it's a lens, but it has the same effect as looking through a magnifying glass at an angle with, with paper underneath of it. So your goal within a game, if you're the tech artist or the person who's kind of in charge of setting up the pipeline is, how are we going to fake that? And you have all kinds of levels. The lowest level would be a very triangle limited um, diffuse only texture video game. And that's where you're just maybe going to have a flat plane that has a picture of an eye textured on it. And that would be like this. So I'm going to show an example for each of the um, different types of eyes. So um, this character works like that. So he basically has a completely flat, uh, here's the, you can see here, it's just a totally flat piece of geometry with a picture of an eye textured on it. You get none of the effects of the realism from how a real eye would work. And that's just by design. It's too low poly. There's no technology and shaders in the game, so you don't do any of that. The next level would be getting to have a, um, and in, in that one also you can't aim the eyes. There's no such thing as looking around. So the next level, it has kind of two ways you can do it. You can have a um, sphere inside the head, so you can see there's a sphere here, and or also in um, So the next level up is just having a sphere inside of the head. I think hers work like this as well. And the sphere can rotate, but you just put the texture of the eye on top of it. And so there's so it's it's just a round sphere. There's you don't get any of the effects of the lens or any of the realism from that, but you can at least aim the eyes around, which is adds a lot of realism, especially if there's a good um, you know some jitter to the aim of the eyes. The other, the other way to accomplish that is like they did in Doom 3 where they, you have um, the white of the eye is textured on a flat plane. So there's a so, it's a solid mesh all the way up. But then there's a disc that has the iris and pupil textured on it. And the disc itself has its pivot point where the eye would be and you rotate that around. So that way you can have like a nice high poly or a, a, a nice highly uh, detailed texture of the pupil and iris because you can pop a disc almost anywhere within a texture and, and stretch it up and get a lot of detail. But then the white of the eye and the lacrimal chronicle and the eyelid itself are all this seamless part of the UVs and the head. And, and this sphere is just a solid object and it doesn't do anything. The only thing that's moving is this disc rotating around and that at least lets you do the aiming and that, that's how they did it in Doom 3. Uh, then the next level up is you can have just, um, you, you, you get, there's multiple ways to accomplish it, and that's where you have the way to aim the eye, but you also have this kind of uh, lens built in somehow. So, the pr and the problem with this is that there's no easy off-the-shelf solution for it. There's a cool shader that a guy who works for Valve made called, um, I think he works for Valve, I'm not sure. Uh, and he's from this area. Uh, I think he went to AIP. His name was um, uh, Carlos. Uh, Terra. Yeah, Carlos yeah. Terra. Yeah, and he made, it's called, his nickname is Seaman 2K, like 2000. And he made an eye shader. And I've got a version of this um, using it. So this is with my eye solution, and this is with his eye shader solution. And what his does is it's just one sphere with the lens modeled into it. But then it uses a diffraction effect so that when you're looking at it from the side, the shader itself offsets the iris and the pupil inside. So instead of looking like the, the picture of the iris and the pupil is mapped on the top of the iris, it actually makes it look like it's pushed behind. So the specular is only rendered out here and the iris and pupil are rendered here. And that way you just have one object you don't get any Z buffer fighting if you have eyelash planes or hair planes going from the eye because there's no alpha being used on that solution at all. But um, I didn't quite like the aesthetic look of his. Like the eyes all take on this very contrasty look, but the effect of the um, 
pushing the iris in works really, really well. And that's free and off the shelf and works in that. And then the other way to do it is to kind of um, hack it with two objects. So this is the eye itself, and it's dented in. You can see that it curves in. And this is what makes it look like from the side that is being refracted. Because the a, a real physical eye is actually flat. It doesn't, doesn't go in. It's just flat. But by curving it in, when you look at it from the side, it looks like it's being refracted inward. And then there's a lens object sandwiched on top of it. So here they're both in the same place, and here they're exploded. So normally this is directly over top of it. And so what that does is you get the specular highlight flows on the outside of this lens that pokes out, but the diffuse is shown on this iris, and you get the, the fake of the, this lens poking out. And this is a way that just works with the, the Soleil shader. You can use regular 3D Studio Max, and it just is a way to do it off the shelf and get more realistic looking eyes. Um, so that's why I did this way. And then you'll notice there's one thing here. This is a, um, your eyes are constantly lubricated, and so you actually have a bit of uh, liquid that accumulates between the ledge of the eyelid and the eyeball itself. And if you ever get close enough up or you take a picture of a person or their eyes are watering, there are lots of times where you'll see a little highlight bounce off of that ledge. And so this is a way to fake it with just a little edge of um, triangle. So you can see right here that you see here the kind of, um, and it's this is much less subtle than you really see in a real person, but because this is something we normally see. It's better to have it there and be a bit too large than have it missing completely. Uh, and then I provided uh, a kind of like how I took the original eye itself and, and created the eye texture. And then this is the normal for the uh, eye sphere itself with some of the veins built in. They're very subtle. And this is the normal map for the, the shell. And then even I made like a video so that you can see um, in like a higher resolution what happens when the eyes are rotated around. And there's lots of ways that can be faked and tons of companies have their own way of doing it. Like um, what was what was the game that Sam Archelon worked on before God of War? Was, was it one of its rates? Resistance, yeah, resistance two. And what he did is he just had, um, uh, I think it was a shell over top that wasn't, it didn't rotate with the eye. It was actually, the eye itself was flat, and then he had a shell that just stayed with the head, and that had the specular on it. So it was, the, the eyeball would rotate inside of the shell, and the shell would hold the specularity. And on um, the old PlayStation 2 Bond games, they actually just took a physical triangle and textured it pure white and made it never be lit. And it was just rigged to the same bone as the head. And it just always stayed right here. And the eyeball itself could rotate. There was no specular. It was just this little white triangle emulated uh, specular highlight. Because it was better having one that didn't move at all, but you got this <coughs> white shiny spot on the eyes. That did more for the realism than not having it there, but the sphere reacts to the lighting of the room or whatever. So there's a lot of tricky ways to do it, but when you're trying to have a high level of realism or detail, and you've got eyelashes and pores on the face and all of that, but then the eyes are just textured on a sphere, you get games like Mass Effect 2 and 3, which had just god-awful eyes in the game. They really looked bad. Um, was that your question answered about the eye? Okay. And then you had a question about uh, shoulder rigging. So one of the things, so here is a, uh, so this is my uh, biped that I use. And there, you'll see there's one, two, three, four helper bones per side of the body. And what these are, it's just a helper object. They're parented to the bone above them. So the knee bone is parented to the hip bone. The hip. This one's parented to the pelvis, this one to the upper arm, and this one to the clavicle. And then they have a orientation constraint pointed to both bones at 50-50%. So when the one here, when the elbow bends, let's say, or let's say my arm, this is, is bent um, 90 degrees, the helper bone is at a 45 degree angle. 
so it always just has half the rotation. And then when I rig the model, I add those to the rig, so they're in there as bones. Now that adds to your bone count, so you have to figure out which one is the most important. So for example, if I don't have enough for all five fingers with three joints and one here, one here, one here, one here, then I'll back it off to just maybe the shoulder one and the hip one. And then if I can only have two of them, I'll just do the shoulder ones. So it's, or, or maybe it's really, really important that the knees look good. For example, if all of your characters have um, like a, a knee protectors or some kind of design knee pad to it, then maybe you only have the knee ones with no help. So, but it really works well for the, for the upper shoulder to have this bone that's like half and half. So then I have a, uh, this is a, a model going through my stretch animation. I made this a long time ago and it basically just goes through each bone at a time because I find it really difficult if the, uh, when, when the uh, stretch animation is all happening at once because let's say you're working on the wrist and if it's built in like this, it's constantly moving out of the camera so it's much better to fix the elbow and then move to the next five frames and you can, and the camera doesn't have to move and then the next five frames, that kind of thing. So I just load this up on every character when I go to rig it. And this is, she's already been totally done, so the shoulders um, and the elbows and knees and everything uh, keep a lot more volume with these helper bones than without them. And then I have a max file showing you. So this shoulder is using, if I show the helper bones, is in here. have to think about, um, you kind of have two general uh, edge flows that you can follow with shoulders. And I don't, I don't know if I have a good example in wireframe. Okay, this one kind of works. So the best thing, the best uh, deformation comes from a McDonald's bendy straw, where there's a, there's a loop at every change in direction because then it's like it's it's if you take a, a cylinder and you basically make two edge rings and you move this one over to here you can see they just the line that they make between totally collapses it doesn't have any of the volume in the middle that it has here but if you were to put three edges and you move this one down and you move this one in the middle they they roughly keep the volume of the whole thing so in a shoulder if you think of that in a shoulder even though the shape changes and maybe someone's not skinnier, maybe someone has like, what the character you're making has weird shapes to it or whatever, you're still going, you have to think of it going from a tube to another tube. So you want a ring here, a ring here, a ring here, and have the ring slowly follow the direction because then what you get is each one of those rings can be somewhere between, uh, you, the furthest one down, okay, this one exists 100% in the world space of the upper bone, the one here, okay, this one, exists 100% in the space of the clavicle and the um, upper body bone, so that they're kind of divided, but it's still the torso itself. And then the ones in the middle are essentially 50-50. If you, um, but the, the, what the helper bones do is, the, the way rigging works is you basically, you've got a world space for each bone. And when you have two verts, this one's 100% in this bone, this one's 100% in this bone, and they move around, it's just perfect like this. But if you have a new edge ring or just a vert in the center and you make it 50-50, it just always tries to average the distance between where these two world spaces are. And so oftentimes that will collapse downward or you will lose the, um, uh, the volume of the object because it's just fading 50-50 between these two world spaces. So the helper bone adds a third world space in between so that if you put a ring in the center, it's not just fading between the 50-50 of these two world spaces. 
it has its own world space that it's rotating within, and it'll keep a lot more volume. So it adds another bone, but it'll help you keep volume in objects. And then especially if you have things on top, like a piece of armor or um, you know something floating on top or a knee pad or anything that needs to hold its volume a lot, then you might have the leg underneath be rigged between the bone helper and lower bone, 50-50, uh, whatever. But then the thing on top, you might be able to rig 100% to the helper bone, and it'll totally hold its volume. Like, if, for example, knight armor or um, you know a, a, a Sony Walkman or just any kind of thing that you could have that's inorganic. Well, you you know if, if you just put all of the verts 50% in this bone and 50% in this bone, it could fall through the object or float way up. Whereas when you put it up on the helper bone, now it just rotates smoothly between where it needs to go. And especially for armor, I hate seeing something super realistic that's textured to look like a piece of metal and then it bends, you know, or stretches out when it's rigged because that just totally breaks the uh, realism of the object. Um, did that answer your question about, yeah. do you have anything like even further within the rigging that you um, have questions on? I've heard that some people uh, just get like the accurate definition of going all the way up, but it just is really hard to model Um, it kind of depends on the, the, the target uh, medium. So for example, with like, you know, the Hulk model from the, from the movie, that has to just be so anatomically perfect. And um, they have now in the new version of ZBrushes coming out to where you can actually sculpt for pose. So you can go and like make the model like this so it's anatomically accurate and then put, I forget how ZBrush keeps track of skeletons and transpose or whatever. But then you can move it up, and it'll deform it, but now you can re-sculpt it, and it'll keep that sculpt as like a morph target here, and it'll blend between the two. And that's exactly how they had for you know whatever solution they had within Houdini or XSI that they were using in digital domain. So, but the problem with morph targets within games is that, like I was saying with the head yesterday, it's basically having to keep all of those vertices in, within the model the whole time. So bones are always superior to morph targets, at least within the realm of how game engines work now. So the next best thing would be to start using bones as um, muscle simulation. So for example, you could put a bone where its origin is here and then a look at position where the insertion point of the pectoral is on the upper arm, and now it will always look at that thing. And if, you, and if your game engine supports bones uh, scaling, you could, uh, in, in just a single axis, you could put, uh, rig some of the vertices from here into that bone, and then you'll get a really realistic as they follow that kind of thing. But when you think about a real body, you basically have these muscles that want to stretch from insertion point A to insertion point B, but then they have these rubber bands of fascia around them that basically, this is why when your arm goes down, your pec can't actually go straight across. It's, it's up because there's a band of fascia around same thing when your knee bends. The tendon isn't straight across from here. It's bent because there's a band of fascia there. And that's incredibly hard to do within 3D. You basically have to fake it. Or, or you know, even the, the movies that have used muscle simulations, I don't know of any of them that have also simulated the fascia to like tighten things. They're normally just using it to make like, you know, a quad jiggle when someone steps down or whatever because it's just it's a really difficult simulation to do. But within games, I don't think I've ever seen um, two models, of, but I've seen lots of morph targets for film work. Like, if there's a difficult pose, totally fix it manually as an artist so that it looks good, and then make it fade between the two. Um, but it's just a bit beyond what most game engines